Hello, everyone. We will kick off in just a minute or two. Why don't we see if we have any more folks trickle in? All right, wonderful. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Hillary Going, and I manage strategic partnerships at Climeworks here in the US. The question of how best to approach creating a carbon dioxide removal strategy and putting together a portfolio of carbon dioxide removal solutions comes up so often in my conversations with corporate sustainability leaders. As a leader in the direct air capture and permanent carbon dioxide removal space, the onus is really on us to create platforms like these for knowledge sharing so that we can all come together and be a part of scaling these incredibly necessary nascent solutions. In that vein, today I'm thrilled to welcome Catherine Hayhoe and Brian D. Marino for a conversation on just that. Catherine will kick us off and speak to the variety of carbon dioxide removal solutions in the market, and then Brian will jump in and share some of the corporate best, corporate best practices that he's developed in his time at J.P. Morgan Chase. From there, we'll have at least 20 minutes for a Q&A, and if you'd like to submit questions, you can do so throughout the presentation using the Q&A function in Zoom. I would love to introduce Catherine Hayhoe first, who is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding the impacts of climate change on people and the planet. Catherine is the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, where she leads and coordinates the organization's scientific efforts. She's also a tenured professor at Texas Tech University and has received numerous awards and recognitions for her work, including being named a United Nations Champion of the Earth. Brian is head of operational sustainability at J.P. Morgan Chase, where he leads the development and implementation of the firm's global operational sustainability strategy and manages, manages its commitments to carbon neutrality, greenhouse gas, water and paper reductions, and the transition to electric vehicles. Under his leadership, J.P. Morgan Chase has worked to define and implement best practices and influence the further development of effective carbon markets. This included negotiating a landmark transaction in May of this year with Climeworks, one of the largest purchases to date in the direct air capture industry between a single corporate buyer and a single CDR company valued above 20 million US dollars. Again, thank you both for being here with us today. Catherine, would love to have you kick us off and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Hillary, and welcome everyone to this webinar. So I am a climate scientist, and as Hillary mentioned, I also serve as chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, which is the largest conservation organization in the world. And what I wanted to do to begin this discussion was to give an overview of how did we get into this situation? Why does it matter to us? And what do the solutions available to us look like? And where does direct air capture fit into that range of solutions, because I think that context is really important and that will help to guide the rest of our discussion. So in order to do that, I've put together some slides. Let me share my screen with you right now. And I've titled my presentation, Silver Buckshot Solutions to the Climate Crisis. And as you go along, you will see why I have titled it this. I wanna start though, back at the beginning. What is the beginning? Well, the beginning of human civilization our population has grown exponentially over just the last few hundred years. 
the world looks radically different today than it looked at any time in human civilization. And if we look at our life expectancy, we see that a big part of that exponential growth was the fact that our life expectancy has far more than doubled in just the past hundred years. What is the number one reason for that happening? The number one reason is that we figured out how to get energy from a way that didn't involve human or animal labor. That's right, figuring out how to get energy from fossil fuels to power and to help develop technology that we just take for granted today, like our refrigerators, our lights, our modes of transportation, even modern medicine. All of this was predicated on the Industrial Revolution that was powered by fossil fuels. But when we started doing this, we did not realize that by digging up and burning massive amounts of coal and gas and oil, that we would in fact be conducting an unprecedented experiment with our planet. How are we doing that? We're doing that because when we burn coal and gas and oil, it produces heat trapping gases. And these heat trapping gases are building up in the atmosphere where they are wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like you would if somebody snuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on your bed when you didn't need it, you would wake up sweating saying, hey, I didn't need this blanket. I'm too warm. That's what's happening to our planet. Now, another way to think about it is in terms of a balance. Before the Industrial Revolution, the global carbon cycle was in balance. The amount of carbon that ecosystems produced, the amount of carbon that the ocean produced was taken up by the amount that it took up every year. It was in balance. But along came humans through the Industrial Revolution and we put our finger on the balance. We started to produce enormous amounts of heat trapping gases without taking them back up. That is the root of our problem. Now, it isn't only fossil fuels. 78% of our heat trapping gases come from burning fossil fuels and from other industrial processes. But 22% come from the decomposition of waste, deforestation, and large scale industrial agriculture. This is the root of the problem. And all of these heat trapping gases have been building up for so long, wrapping that extra blanket around the planet, that today, According to observations, we can see that our world is warming faster than any time in human history. And that's why this matters. It matters because we have 8 billion people on the planet. We have an $85 trillion uh, uh, annual economy. And none of us and none of this is prepared for the rapid changes that we're seeing. Our infrastructure, 40, $50 trillion worth of infrastructure or more, it's all built for a planet that doesn't exist anymore. These rapid changes are putting us all at risk. Often people refer to this issue as global warming because the main indicator that scientists use to track what's happening to our planet is global average temperature. But I prefer to call it global weirding because wherever we live today, things are getting weirder, whether it's the record breaking heat waves going round and round the world. And just look at this summer, heat waves in North America, heat waves in Europe, heat waves in Asia, heat waves in winter in South America, wildfires in the Northwest Territories, in Louisiana, in Hawaii, in the Canary Islands, in Greece, droughts, hurricanes like the one coming ashore in Florida as we speak atmospheric rivers, storms, flooding. Wherever we live, climate change is loading the weather dice against us, making naturally occurring extreme events stronger, more frequent, more dangerous, and more damaging. Just to give you one example from the United States, and we're seeing this around the world everywhere, in the United States, back in the 1980s, there was about $1 billion weather and climate disaster every four months. And yes, this is accounting for how the value of a billion dollars changes over time. Every four months in the 1980s, by the 2010s, we were at every 2.8 weeks. And now this year so far, we've got one happening every two weeks. And I think that number might drop further by the end of the year. 
Climate change is loading the weather dice against us, and this is putting our food at risk. It's putting our water at risk, the air that we breathe, the homes and the infrastructure, the buildings, the roads, all the systems we depend on. That's why it literally it's, it's not about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is about us, we humans, and many of the other species who share our home with us. We are not prepared for this speed of change. That's the problem that we confront. So as you can imagine, as people are seeing this in front of, oh, unfolding in front of their eyes, levels of worry about climate change are skyrocketing. Now, this figure is based on data from two years ago. You can just imagine what it would look like today when every headline is full of heat waves, wildfires, floods, and droughts. Around the world, most people are very worried about climate change. In fact, I checked and there's a new study out for the United States showing that the number of people worried about extreme heat and wildfire is now up to, I think, about 78%. Now, here's the interesting thing. When we get worried about something psychologically, what do we want to do? We want to fix it. And when we want to fix something that we feel is so out of control as a big global issue, and I'm just one person, we tend to think there's got to be something. What is the big red easy button of climate solutions. What is the silver bullet? And so I see headlines all the time. How to stop climate change. Here's the two silver bullets. Geoengineering, is that the silver bullet? Will quantum technology be the silver bullet? I get emails and comments on social media almost every day saying, if everybody in the world just went vegan, that would fix the whole problem. Now, eating more plants is very good for both us and for the planet, and it will reduce our carbon emissions, but it alone will not fix the problem. I have people saying, well, nuclear energy is the solution. I say, well, yes, it's true. Nuclear energy does not produce carbon emissions, but even if everybody around the world could magically create electricity powered by nuclear energy like in the snap of their fingers instead of taking, you know, 5, 10, 15 years and a lot of money, that would still only take care of the emissions associated with electricity. And then we often see people pointing to direct air capture as the silver bullet. In fact, I pulled these two headlines to show you. Could carbon capture be the silver bullet? Time to deploy the silver bullet direct air capture. Well, here's the thing. When it comes to climate solutions, there is no silver bullet. There is no one solution that has the capacity to do it all. There is no solution that, ha that is affordable enough and that has the scope needed to take care of the whole problem for us. And if you hear anybody saying that, you need to be immediately very suspicious. There is no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. There are a lot of solutions that if we deploy them together, including everything that people call a silver bullet, if we deploy all of those solutions together, we do have a chance of tackling this thing. So what I wanna do is I wanna provide you with a image, a metaphor of how to think about this collection of silver buckshot or our toolbox of climate solutions where to put direct air capture, where to put carbon capture and sequestration, where to put clean energy, where do we put all of these different solutions? How do they fit together in our toolbox? And the image I use to do this, it's probably not one you're gonna guess, it is the image of an above ground swimming pool. Now, this is something that I grew up with myself. We had one of these in my backyard growing up in Toronto. And when I was young, there was just enough water in the swimming pool for my toes to touch the ground. That's how I learned how to swim. Now picture the swimming pool as our atmosphere. And before the industrial revolution, it had just the right amount of water in the swimming pool. So our collective toes could metaphorically touch the ground. The water are the heat trapping gases. And before the industrial revolution, we had just the right amount of heat trapping gases to keep us the perfect temperature for life. Our toes could touch the ground. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a hose in the swimming pool, and we've been turning that hose up every year. 
During the first year of the pandemic, we turned it down 7%, and then we just turned it right back up again. But then there's one more piece of the swimming pool that matters here, and that is the fact that our swimming pool has a drain. A drain is a way to take water out of the pool, to take carbon emissions and heat trapping gases out of the atmosphere. So when we talk about climate solutions, there's three big categories of climate solutions. Category number one, turn off the hose, right? Because if we don't turn off the hose, there's no way we can make the drain big enough to take all that extra heat trapping gases out of the atmosphere. We just can't do it. We've calculated at the Nature Conservancy that if we invested in all the nature-based solutions around the world that we could possibly do, first of all, they would have tremendous co-benefits for clean air, clean water, biodiversity, and they would take about a third of our carbon emissions from the hose out of the atmosphere. A third if we did everything we could in terms of nature. Cleanworks has calculated how much direct air capture could take out. It's less than that. It can take out about a billion tons. So we need it all, but we have to turn off the hose, otherwise nothing else works. What else do we have to do? We have to make the drain bigger through investing in nature and technologies like direct air capture, but then there's one more thing we have to do. We have to learn how to swim because our toes don't touch the ground already. That's adaptation and resilience. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you some specific concrete examples of each one of these so you see what I'm talking about. Let's start with turning off the hose. What does turning off the hose look like? Often people immediately jump to clean energy and clean energy is a way to turn off the hose. But there's something I would put ahead of clean energy and that is efficiency. We are so wasteful with our energy and with our food and with our resources. There's tremendous potential. In fact, in the United States, half of US carbon emissions could re be reduced through efficiency alone which includes industrial efficiency, supply chain efficiency, transportation efficiency, building retrofits and more. Clean energy, better land use and agriculture to eliminate the emissions from those sectors, behavioral change so we don't need the energy in the first place. And this is the category where you would put carbon capture and storage because if you're burning the natural gas, for example, but you're trapping the CO2 before it goes into the atmosphere and putting it underground, then you're diverting the hose elsewhere. So efficiency, what does that look like? It can look like something as simple as LED lighting or smart thermostats, or as complex as making ocean shipping efficient. What about replacing fossil fuels with clean energy? Solar, wind, heat pumps, concentrated solar for high temperature industrial processes. There's all kinds of different incredibly inventive and increasingly affordable ways to get energy without requiring fossil fuels. What about solutions that prevent deforestation, that help agriculture reduce its emissions? There's all kinds of ways that we can even use technology there. Reducing deforestation, figuring out where it's going to happen in advance, making sure it doesn't. Reducing emission from agriculture through smart fertilizer applications, conservation agriculture. The diversity of the solutions is amazing and encouraging. And then the carbon capture here, it's never going into the atmosphere. You're diverting it so it never comes out of the hose and it goes underground. And this is a really helpful diagram from the BBC that shows one, one example of a project they're talking about doing. But just out of curiosity, I gave it a quick Google and literally like in the last three days, there's all kinds of headlines about projects like this being either um, planned or new ways developed to do this more efficiently. So this all relates to the hose, but now let's talk about the drain. Often with the drain, people immediately say, similar to with the hose, they say clean energy. With the drain, they say, oh, plant trees. And planting trees is a way of making the drain bigger because as the tree grows, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere. But it turns out that the most effective way to make that drain bigger is actually to protect the ecosystems we already have, to restore the ecosystems that are already degraded to their full function. Then number three, to regenerate ecosystems, and that includes tree planting. Number four is climate smart agriculture. There's ways to not only reduce the emissions from agriculture, 
but to turn agriculture into a carbon sink. Through regenerative practices like cover crops, where you plant a cover crop, it grows, it takes up the carbon from the atmosphere as it grows, and then you plow it back into the ground where it puts all that carbon back in the ground where it's a tremendous fertilizer for the crop they're going to grow. And this is the category where direct air capture goes to because it is taking water out of the pool. It is literally capturing carbon from the atmosphere and turning it into something that can be put underground or in some other permanent type of sequestration where it will not interact with the atmosphere over long time frames. There's all kinds of amazing solutions here. I could talk all day about ways to make the drain bigger. Um, one of the interesting things that the Nature Conservancy is involved in is working with countries that are rich in biodiversity, but have crippling national debt. Helping to find organizations, financial institutions who will restructure their debt, help them save on the interest they pay, if in exchange they will use that interest to set aside for the Barbados, for Barbados 30% of their marine areas protected area, or for Ecuador to protect the Galapagos Islands, Belize, Seychelles, all kinds of countries with incredible biodiversity are taking advantage of these financial mechanisms to protect the ecosystems they already have. Here again, we can use technology to track what's happening in deforestation, wetlands and more and protect it better. There's climate solutions that can restore and regenerate ecosystems and promote climate smart agriculture. These little graphics here come from Project Drawdown. If you haven't checked it out yet, I encourage you to do so. They've got more than 100 climate solutions described there in every category that I've talked about. In fact, it would be really fun to go there, list out my three categories, go there and see if you can match up each one of those solutions with each one of those categories. These include everything from uh, silvopasture, planting trees alongside your crops to conserve nutrients, water and carbon or to allowing indigenous peoples to manage their own lands to protect the carbon and the biodiversity in their lands. And then finally here, this is where we have direct air capture and I deliberately copied these two silver bullet headlines to this slide because you can see they are not silver bullets, but they are absolutely 100% important pieces of silver buckshot within the context of turning off the hose, making the drain bigger, and then finally, learning how to swim. Learning how to swim is where I spend a lot of my time as a climate scientist, working with engineers to figure out how to make our built environment more resilient, working with technology experts to figure out how to make our everything from our agriculture to our supply chains to our cities more resilient, creating resilience through adding nature to cities, helping people alter their behavior to become less vulnerable to the droughts and wildfires. We have climate solutions to help infrastructure become more resilient. And I'm actually part of a group that's been doing that for 10 years. We have climate solutions that use technology to make us more resilient, whether it's digital technology or warning systems or citizen science. We have climate solutions that use nature to build resilience into our cities, to flood and heat and storm surge. And we have climate solutions that alter our policies and laws and behavior to help make us more resilient and healthier. All of these are solutions that we need. We can't pick and choose. We have to turn off the hose. If we don't, this won't work. We have to make the drain bigger because the more carbon we take out of the atmosphere, the better off we'll all be. And we have to learn how to swim because many of the changes have already happened today and we must adapt. But it's not just about avoiding the worst. Climate solutions can save us money. Decarbonizing the energy system by 2050 could save at least $12 trillion. Nature-based solutions could yield $4 trillion in economic value. Nature-based markets are valued at $7 trillion. And it isn't even about the dollars. Climate solutions also clean up our air and our water. They protect us from storms and disasters. They improve our physical and mental health. They provide us with more, not less, affordable energy. They reduce our inequalities. They create healthy ecosystems and foodscapes. And they give us a more stable world when we understand the many, many, many pieces of silver buckshot that are available to us. 
When we understand the tremendous benefits they have for people and the planet working together, the only question I have at this point is what are we waiting for? Thank you. Wonderful. Catherine, thank you so much. You know, I think it's so important to call out here that these solutions are absolutely not a substitute for cutting fossil fuel emissions. It has to be reductions as well as removals. And I also think your point just about the complementary nature of so many of these solutions working together is such an important one to know. You know, as you said, there's no quick fix here. There's no silver bullet. And we can accomplish far more working together than we can apart. So thank you so much. I'd love to turn it over to Brian now and hear a little bit more about your experience at J.P. Morgan Chase, establishing best practices in sustainability strategy, catalyzing the scaling of emerging solutions, and, and working to further develop effective carbon markets. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you for Climeworks for putting this on. And thanks, Catherine, for your presentation, which uh, is one of those tough to follow presentations, so appreciate it. Um, and I love the analogy of the hose and the drain uh, in the pool. I also had an above ground pool, but but they they didn't. I was pretty tall, so I didn't have to let the water off my toes to touch when I was a kid. But but um, I think it's important to repeat uh, what you said and what Hillary just echoed as well, which is carbon removal is not the the solution. It's part of the solution, right? It is a toolkit of solutions, and so. We are very focused, as I hope all corporates would be, on reducing their absolute emissions. Um, all the things actually that Catherine pointed out, we're doing, whether it's energy efficiency. In general, JP Morgan is a bank, and so our, our largest emissions come from, operationally come from real estate uh, and travel. Those are the two biggest pieces of our emissions uh, you know, from our day-to-day -day operations. And so we're very focused on building efficiencies, electrification, uh, you know, on-site generation, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, those are very capital intensive solutions and they take a long time to implement. It just takes time to get the materials, get them on site, get them implemented and get it going. And so we know over time, we will continue to emit as a company and we've already emitted in the past. And so there's an existing pool of carbon dioxide that we need to, to remove now. And there's, a, there's ongoing emissions that we need to, that are unabated and we'll need to manage in the sort of medium and even to long term. And so as we do that, uh, JP Morgan has made a commitment to, to removing the CO2 that we continue to emit. And so there's a few different ways that we've, we've done that. Since 2007, in fact, we've been buying nature-based solutions. In fact, a lot of them uh, uh, through a partnership with the Nature Conservancy, we've got a great relationship with TNC. Um, and we've been, we've been doing that for a, a good amount of time. Over the past year, uh, we've started to get into the engineered removal space, and that's what created the relationship we now have with Climeworks uh, and others. And I, I'm going to share a slide. I don't have quite as many as, as Catherine did, but um, just maybe quickly to talk about kind of how we're getting into this space. Um, what you see here is uh, in May, JP Morgan made an announcement uh, to purchase over $200 million of high quality carbon removal. We did that through four separate transactions, and we thought that that was important because while we could simply focus on you know, direct air capture, or we could just focus on, in this case, charm and bio oil, or we could just focus on a nature-based solution, for instance, we wanted to really support the market as a whole, multiple technologies, and show that this market itself needs to start moving forward. All of the solutions, again, the, the buckshot approach, not one individual bullet. And so um, just really quickly to touch on what we did um, and who we worked with. So. Uh, CO280 is an, uh, a, a startup, effectively. Uh, they are an, an incredible company. We really like them. They're doing point source capture. So Catherine pointed out, like ca capturing carbon from uh, natural gas plants. They're doing biogenic CO2 carbon capture, point source capture from pulp and paper. So think about trees have already captured the CO2 in their natural process. As those trees are removed and used for creation of paper or timber, um, that CO2 does not need to be re-emitted. So they can, through their process, actually remove the CO2 and store it similar to the way that Climeworks does. Uh, on the bottom left, we have the Climeworks transaction, which, which Hillary mentioned in the, in, in the intro. Um, uh, 25,000 metric tons of CO2 with Climeworks, the largest uh, uh, that they have signed to date. And we hope that um, uh, someone pushes us down on that lead table. Um, and just as another point, I think this is an inter interesting and important, as a financial institution, 
we can support this market in other ways. And so the second bullet here, uh, JP Morgan in, 2020, uh, in 2022, um, we're the sole place in Asia on a $650 million private raise of capital. And that's important because these markets and these companies need capital and they need it now. Frontier, uh, top right, Frontier is a, it's called an advanced market commitment. So it's a group of corporates that got together and agreed to buy at a certain quality level, in this case of, of carbon dioxide removal. We joined that at a $75 million commitment. In fact, 25 million of that we've earmarked for client use. So also using the breadth of our business and our client base to say, hey, if you're interested in getting involved and you just want to dip a tone, you're not ready to jump in all the way, that's okay. Come talk to us and we're happy to help you get involved through the Frontier program. And then Charm uh, was the last one. Charm produces bio oil, um, again, from, from biogenic feedstocks. So in their case, typically agricultural waste. Yet the think of corn or, or that agricultural products or even, even forest um, uh, refuse. They take that and they turn it into an oil. It's a very high content carbon oil and they can pump that underground into existing um, oil wells uh, in the salmon aquifers and to geological formations. And so again, our goal was really to try to support this entire market in its um, in its sort of infancy. It's growing and it's growing fast. I, I sort of put it in like the, the dog years camp. It's it's you know every year I feel like we get like seven or ten years of growth in this market, whereas you know a traditional market may have grown a lot slower. That's what we need to see. The other thing that we did, and I want to take a step back because as we talk about building a portfolio, we are not just buying CDR engineered removal. We are buying nature-based removal as well. We continue to do that. We are supporting all of it. But this particular purchase was focused on our scope one emissions. And so we'll get into it a little bit as we talk, but I think there's value in aligning your purchases because there's such a broad swath from, you know, um, uh, again, nature-based all the way through hybrid stuff like biochar, then into bio oil and all the way up through, through direct air capture. There's a massive uh, breadth of solutions out there that scale a whole bunch of different technologies, different pathways, different, uh, different attributes and, and different price points to be quite honest. And so finding a way to align your, your strategy and your purchases with your own emissions or your own strategy is important one, in, in getting it done, two, in sending a clear market signal. So in our case, where we've aligned our entire scope on emissions to this level of removal, we think that's important because it tells the market that for, you know, effectively forever in perpetuity or until we solve the climate crisis, which we're hoping, hoping we do sooner rather than later, JP Morgan will be covering its scope on emissions with this level of carbon removal. It tells this market, it tells Climeworks, it tells CO280, it tells Charm, tells all these other companies that JP Morgan's in the market for the long term. We will not go, in this case, cover this 100,000 tons, which is our scope on emissions. We won't cover that with anything but this type of engineered removal. So we think that that's important. The only other thing I want to talk about briefly here, and I know I want to get to the Q&A because I think it's probably maybe the most important part, is how we think about our principles for accessing the carbon markets. And so this is a very summarized version of a white paper that we produced in conjunction with our purchases of CDR, which says this is how JP Morgan views the voluntary carbon market and how we look to acquire carbon removal. And this is really just eight attributes. We did not, to be very clear, we did not reinvent, um, you know, anything. We did not, you know, we didn't, we're not putting anything out here that I think is necessarily new or different. We collated our thoughts and we did that by, you know, looking at existing standards and literature, uh, getting guidance from leading, uh, leading organizations out in the market, uh, internally deliberating about what mattered to us and, and consulting with experts and stakeholders uh, around the bank and, and, and beyond. And we came up with, this is sort of our approach. And again, I don't know that it's so important these eight specific attributes as much as it is that uh, a large corporate like JP Morgan put its name out there publicly and said, this matters to us. And so, you know, very quickly to touch on these, these things have to, whatever we buy, it has to be real, which means it has to have actually happened. It may seem kind of silly to have to say that, but quite honestly, it's important. It has to be real. It has to have actually taken place. You have to be able to measure it. We keep talking about MRV in this space. Um, you know, measurement, reporting, and verification. It's so, so, so important that we do this. And we want that to be 
uh, third party verified as well. So the top right, independently verified. We want to be able to measure it. We want it to be able to be independently verified. Super important. We think of this no different than we think of our accounting uh, and our financial reporting. We need to have third parties assure that this stuff is happening the right way. Um, they need to be ultimately additional. So the baselining is very important, uh, particularly in the nature-based space, how we set a baseline to say, if not for this project, what would have happened, which is ultimately counterfactual. It's ultimately a what if that you may or may not ever be able to prove, but it has to be thoughtful and it has to be driven by the existing market dynamics of that project. Um, has to be unique and traceable, right? So no double counting and you have to be able to track uh, uh, the, the, the output. Uh, leakage avoidance. So we wanna make sure that there is a, a low chance that what is stored or sequestered is ever re-released or at least within a, a specific time frame. Um, therefore it has to be durable and we want high permanence Generally, we consider a thousand years or more of storage permanent removal. And that's the type, again, back to that CDR scope one link. That's what we're really looking for there. And um, climate equity, right? So we want to make sure that these projects support and elevate you know, uh, local frontline marginalized communities where feasible, which gets a little bit into these additional considerations like co-benefits, uh, supporting indigenous populations, biodiversity, supporting um, uh, uh, endangered uh, species or, or things like that. Cost, obviously important, and not necessarily that the cost has to be low, but that the, the companies that we're doing, uh, we're, we're accessing the carbon markets with, we want to be scalable. We want them to be companies that we believe will scale and ultimately be accessible to the market as a whole. Uh, like I mentioned, scalability and then innovation, we find it really, really interesting to get involved with companies that are innovating in this space. And there's a lot of traditional stuff, which we also support, but we're always looking, again, additionally, but beyond the eight criteria, we're looking for innovation and companies that are trying to do something a little bit different because that's what we really need. Again, back to the sort of silver buckshot, we need a lot of different approaches uh, and we need a lot of that to happen very quickly. So this has just generally been our, uh, the way that we've been thinking about this. We really, we've matured on this over a very short period of time. This market has matured over a very short period of time and it will continue to do so. And so I think the last piece that I'll say, and I'll stop sharing my screen uh, to say it is, it is imperative that we accept the fact that this is science and science is ultimately like a, the, long, the longest term learning exercise that there is. We are gonna continue to learn. We don't know everything. One of the things we're very clear about in the paper that we published is that we are educable, that we want to have debate about this, that we want to understand what is changing and that we will continue to learn as we move forward. And we will learn in public, which means we may fail in public. And being very open and honest with our stakeholders, which includes uh, our operating committee, includes our board, and includes our shareholders, and includes our employees, includes customers to say, this is not necessarily easy. If Catherine started out by saying she's a climate scientist. I'm not. JP Morgan doesn't really have climate scientists, right? And so we work with people who, are, who understand the space really well, but we're trying very hard to get it right. And it doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect the first time, but we're gonna keep moving forward, right? I, there's like this, this phrase out there that, um, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of good or something like that. I, I sort of bastardize into perfect is the enemy of progress. We're not gonna wait for perfect solutions to move forward. We're gonna keep walking in the right direction. And if we trip, we trip. If we fall, we'll get back up. But we're going to keep moving forward. And so that has generally just been our approach to this. And we've gotten a lot of support in doing that. And I think it's been helpful uh, to be public about what we're doing and, and get feedback that we have, which has generally been positive. Um, so I'll pause there because I know we're going to talk more about stuff during the Q&A. And I think I'm right around my time. So uh, I'll hand it back to you, Hillary. Thank you so much, Brian. It sounds like this orientation that you guys have taken around these discrete principles kind of as your North Star was such a critical first step. And, you know, to your point, you said science is, of course, at the root of all of this work, but having a criteria like that to help you think through and assess those economics as you're bringing different stakeholders to the table and executing this kind of strategy sounds like just the most invaluable piece to it. And I, I heard you mention those kind of different stakeholders that you've engaged throughout this process. You know, we're not we're not all climate scientists. Um, and it, it sounds like that was another invaluable piece here of, you know, no one party has all of the information, even if you are a climate scientist. And 
bringing uh, everybody together is a really critical piece of that. To, to go back to Catherine's point, you know, we can accomplish far more working together than we can apart. So really, really appreciate that perspective. With that, um, I think we can dive into the Q&A portion. Um, and it looks like the first question here is for Catherine. Catherine, what role should companies play when it comes to climate action? Can they change the game? That's a great question. So um, actually, before that, I'm going to address a couple of questions people had, which is, where do I find out more? So I just want to reiterate, this is being recorded. You can get the video afterwards, not the slides. And I'm going to just put a link there with some more resources if anybody's interested. And I appreciate all the interest. So um, coming up this fall is the next big climate COP meeting. And that's where all the countries in the world get together to talk about um, how we can meet the Paris targets. But what people don't realize is it isn't just up to countries. It's also up to organizations, cities and companies. In fact, in many cases, those subnational and multinational actors can act a lot more quickly than countries can. So when it comes to turning off the hose, making the drain bigger and learn how to swim, we need every company of every size. And again, to companies, I would add cities, schools, universities, organizations, tribal nations, churches, rotary clubs. I would add everybody to that. All of us need to be doing this. And companies need to realize, again, there is no profit on a dead planet. We have to take steps as quickly as possible to do all three. And so just as Brian talked about, companies can first of all look at what we call their scope one and scope uh, two emissions. So what are the emissions that they actually produce? That's a great place to start. But then companies have to look at what are the emissions that we enable? What is our scope three emissions? Do we produce something which people then use to create huge amounts of heat trapping gases? Do we finance something that people then use to produce huge amounts of heat trapping gases? This is the bigger question that we all have to confront now. It's no longer enough to do an energy audit, change the light bulbs and provide bike cracks. We have to look at the root cause, which is our addiction to fossil fuels. And we have to implement all of these solutions at scale together and companies are key. In fact, I would go so far to say, we can't do it without them. Thank you so much, Catherine. Brian, I have our next one for you. What would your advice be to companies who'd like to get started on building their carbon full portfolios? Maybe you can give us a top top couple of pieces of advice there. Yeah, um, start. Uh, you know, it, it might seem a little silly, but, um, you know, start somewhere. It doesn't have to be a super expensive purchase. Um, it's just about sort of getting involved. And so um, maybe a couple of thoughts on sort of a had one measure, right? So we talked about that a little bit already just a second ago. You do have to measure and understand what it is that you're working against. You do have to understand the, the, the origin of your emissions and you need to work to try to reduce those. But then you need to figure out how you're going to manage your unabated emissions. And that is a big one. And so to get involved, like set goals, right? They don't need big goals right away, but set goals. I'd love for them to be big. Make them really big. Be super ambitious. Big, big, hairy, audacious goals are fantastic in the climate space. Try really hard. Stretch yourself. Do all those things, but set some goals. Um, if you're in an organization, you know, understand what the, what your motivations are as an organization. What are your existing, existing public stances on certain things and find ways to interweave them. What are your limitations as an organization? Do you have a relatively small balance sheet? Do you need to finance these types of purchases? Like understand what your limitations are. And then be honest with your stakeholders. And I, I talked about that before. You have to be really honest about what this looks like and, and that it may not be perfect and that you may, you know, people may not like what you're doing or they may accuse you of greenwashing or they may, whatever it might be. Have some conviction in what you're doing and do it. And then, like I said, start. You have to start somewhere. Don't, don't look for a perfect solution. Uh, build your own principles. If you want to use ours, that's why we made them public. Other companies have done this. Understand what this market looks like. Go access some, some really smart people. There's a lot of them out there now who can help you on this stuff. You don't have to be a climate scientist. You can talk to them. There are plenty of them who will consult with you. There are groups out there that you can work with that you can, you can hire to do uh, to, to, to look at specific projects for you and tell you where they think things are really strong or where they're weak and make a decision, uh, a risk-based decision. That's what corporations are looking for. They want to understand the risk that they're 
that they're taking, the Catherine's point, not doing anything is still a choice, right? So not moving is still a choice. You're choosing not to do anything. And there's just as much risk in doing that as there is in doing something. There's reputational risk, there's regulatory risk, there's consumer risk, there's commercial risk, there's financial risk, there's risk in not doing anything. So my view is start. And if you have questions about it or you're concerned about it, come and talk to me about it. And I'll tell you what it took us to get started. It wasn't easy. Thank you so much, Brian. I, you know, hearing about kind of just setting goals and getting kicked off and understanding those limitations and priorities is, is a really solid place to start. And I think, you know, the next question kind of leads into this, you know, as for companies that have done that or, you know, are along in that process and, you know, maybe are looking at decarbonizing and making reductions. Um, if as reductions remain a priority, why should these companies be engaging in, in purchasing carbon dioxide removal instead of just continuing to focus exclusively on reductions? You know, why is it important to kind of have those both at the same time? It's not an and or, right? It's just not, right? We have to do both and we have to we have to do them now. And so it's, I mean, quite honestly, part of it's just like, it's accountability, right? Be accountable for the fact that, you know, we, we effectively leverage the atmosphere to, for, you know, it, it's not on purpose. We, we built this economy the way we built it over the past couple of hundred years. It, it made sense to us for a long time. We now understand the implications of that. Great. We understand it. Now take responsibility, take accountability, and start managing those unabated emissions and do that now. Build yourself a, you know, a really strong roadmap on, on decarbonizing. And if you're not ready to set like a specific, you know, a specific decarbonization target, which you should, but if you're not ready to do that, at least get, again, get on the journey and focus on managing those unabated emissions. I think what you'll find is if you really start looking at whatever your business is and what it takes to decarbonize it, there is this marginal cost of abatement. At some point, you know, there's a dollar of capital worth spending versus a dollar of offset worth spending. And, and you know, I think what will happen is we'll see as the price of these types of offsets comes down, it makes it more, more beneficial to go, um, you know, to go do this stuff. But right now, the fact that some of them are pretty expensive is actually really useful from an economics perspective doing the capital project to reduce your emissions actually makes a ton more sense right now than it does necessarily do the CDR. And so figure out, doesn't matter, but canvas the whole, your whole emissions portfolio and figure out what you want to do in different places first. But, but don't just do one thing, work on all of it. Try to make progress in every different place and, and see where you get the softest, you know, the, soft, the, the least resistance and push really hard there and then work on all of it. Awesome. Yeah, Brian, I hear you kind of speaking to this holistic and kind of long-term strategy that it's so critical to, to develop. Catherine, I would also love to hear your perspective in terms of the same question. You know, why, why do you feel it's important to be doing both reductions and removals at the same time? Yes. Well, and as Brian said, um, we, have to, we have to do both. And so we need to reduce our emissions as much as possible, as soon as possible. That's the hose. And we need to be turning off the hose more and more every year. So we need to have a plan and the plan can't be, we're setting a goal for 2050 and in 2049, we'll start thinking about how to accomplish it. The plan has to be, we, are ha we have a goal for 2030 and here's what we're doing in 2023. And here's what we're doing in 2024. And here's how we're gonna make our 2030 goal. And then when we make it, here's our next goal and here's how we're gonna meet it year by year. But at the same time, we need to do everything we can first to reduce our emissions and then make the drain bigger to take up the rest that we can't reduce that year. But the amount that we reduce ourselves should be getting bigger every year, and the amount that we rely on making the drain bigger should be getting smaller every year. Because eventually we have to collectively reach net zero, and most of that net zero has to be accomplished through turning off the hose, because at some point we're gonna to get to the point where there's really not much wiggle room to make the drain much bigger. Thanks, Kevin. You know, Brian touched a little bit on, you know, there are all these different solutions at different price points. And I think that leads a little bit into the next question that we received, which was afforestation, nature-based solutions in general, these projects are, are still the cheapest. They're the most widely available at this point by volume and accessibility of all the carbon removal solutions. 
Kathleen, how do you see this evolving between now and say 2040 or 2050? Well, first of all, and this is something people have, have brought up in, in the chat too, we are living in an economy that is heavily skewed towards maintaining our dependence on fossil fuels. The um, IEA just came out with a new study showing that fossil fuels are currently subsidized to the tune of about $13 million US a minute globally. These subsidies have increased over the past couple of years, not decreased. And the risks of climate change in terms of billions and even trillions of dollars of losses are increasing very quickly too. So I think, and this is not my area of expertise, I wanna hear Brian talk about this, but I think we're gonna see, um, and we're already seeing a big awareness of, and hopefully we will soon see a shift in the way that we price and cost the way that we get our energy. So for example, I'm from Canada and in Canada, we have a price on carbon and we have a price on carbon that's going up and up every year to account for the damages, even though our damages are going up year by year as well. And that's one financial mechanism that would help to set the ground, to lay the ground for implementing solutions that make, and this is really important, the best choice and the easiest choice and the most affordable choice, the best choice again for people on the planet at the same time. I know that's sort of a, a macro answer to more of a micro question, but I really see like we're, I see that we're heading in a direction where people are starting to recognize both the risk of inaction and the reward of action. What would you add to that, Brian? Um, yeah, it, it is really interesting because it's such a long-term lens you sort of have to take, but I, I, so carbon taxes are interesting, but I, it gets back to the point about governments versus corporates versus individuals. And while we need everyone, we need all the solutions, we need all the technical solutions, and we need all the individual actors to play, government solutions tend to take a very long time to implement. And so while there's carbon taxes in Canada and there's things happening in Europe, um, there's not in the US, we are likely not to see one in the near future. Um, we'll see, we hope we do, but we're likely not to see one. And so again, you need corporates to sort of decide to do some stuff um, now, as far as kind of like pricing and, and where, where this is going, we do, there will, there may never be price parity between nature-based removal and, and engineered removal. And that may be okay. I think what we're, we need to see is this market find its footing. It's not really, I said this, I, I presented at the Climeworks Summit and I said this at the, um, at the DAX Summit. We call it a market. When people hear the word market, they tend to think, like a market, like an Amazon market, or like a like an equity market, or I think a market. It's not what this is yet, right? Carbon removal is not yet an efficient market in any way, shape, or form. It's a it's typically a corporation calling a project developer, like a J.P. Morgan calling a climber and saying, "Hey, we want to buy some of your stuff," and then we spend months negotiating a contract, and then we negotiate a contract, and then you know, and then they have to go out and get financing to support the projects. It, this stuff takes a long time. We need to move this stuff much faster, and so. I do think we'll see price parity in like the engineered space. I think we'll see price parity in the nature-based space. I still think there's gonna be a gap between those two. And what, what maybe we see happen is that these solutions get used for different parts of scopes of emissions, they get used for different parts of economy, they get used for whatever it might be. Maybe we see a general framework develop where it's, you know, uh, focus on nature-based stuff now because CDR is still developing and then sort of the, the pie chart shifts a bit and get more. These, these frameworks need to be developed, but they don't exist yet. And the other thing I'll say that's been a big struggle from a corporate perspective is all the frameworks that are out there have been developed without sort of the um, complexity of different industries considered. And the way a bank needs to decarbonize versus the way an oil and gas company needs to decarbonize versus a technology company are actually very different. Um, and they have very different implications on their economic models and their shareholders and everything else. And so while this is ultimately a science, a science-based problem and therefore a science-based solution, it will be economically constrained. And we have to find a way to like, to like lift that economic constraint a little bit or really understand it. I think we spend a lot of time understanding the science of climate, like climate economics is gonna be super important that we start to get our head around how to make these things start to move forward. And we're gonna to have to create space to do that. And we're gonna to have to find the right capital structures to do it. We will get there. I do believe that you put smart people against a hard problem, they'll find solutions. But you know, there, there is no great answer yet to where it's all headed. We have to, we have to just have the smart people work on it. 
And Brian, your, your answer reminded me of something that I wish I'd included in my presentation, which is um, I realized I might have inadvertently given the impression that all of these solutions are sort of equally possible and equally affordable. And that's not the case. The solutions are on a tree. And that tree is full of fruit. The fruit are the climate solutions. And some of the fruit is already lying on the ground. And you can just go and pick it up and put it in your basket because if you implement some of those solutions like you know using green infrastructure for flood water controls the amount that you actually put into costing it out versus the amount you're going to save the return is you know like this some of those you have to just reach up and pick off the tree now solar energy is getting to the point where it's the cheapest form of electricity people have ever had in history in many parts of the world we still have to you know bring storage a little bit further down the tree but as we're picking off the fruit that's on the ground and at the bottom of the tree, we have to be working to get to the top of the tree. And that's exactly what we're talking about with direct air capture. When, we, when we've got all of the other you know, solutions collected in our basket, we're implementing all the other solutions, we're gonna need everything on the tree. And it's gonna take a lot longer to figure out how to effectively and efficiently get the fruit off the top of the tree. But we have to be working on that at the same time that we are picking all the fruit off that we can reach today, which is a lot. Here. I love the analogies. They're very helpful. <laughs> My They're simple so mind really <laughs> helped me. They're so memorable too. Um, I, thank you both for sharing that. I think, you know, Brian, I heard you talking about the economics here, and I think that's an aspect of creating a balanced portfolio of CDR solutions that's it's so critical. You know, you're balancing the price per ton and, and likely targeting this average price per ton. But then, you know, thinking about kind of the various maturity levels of solutions, you're also balancing that temporal aspect of, you know, where things are in scaling. And um, I think that's that's a really helpful, you know, point of comparison to note. Um, and apologies, I just had to lost my connection on the video. But I think, unfortunately, we are coming up on time here. Um, so I just wanted to thank each of you again for being here with us today and for the pertinent discussion that you've each facilitated. I'd also like to thank everybody for joining us online. And if you'd like to learn more about insights like these, please subscribe to our newsletter using the QR code um, that is up on the screen right now. And if you happen to be in New York City for Climate Week in a couple of weeks uh, and would like to meet our partnerships team, please reach out to us. I believe we'll be sharing uh, a link um, afterwards via email that you can use to get in touch. Thank you, everybody.